Uh, hello, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Keith Stewart. I'm the uh, video games editor for the uh, Guardian newspaper. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, my colleagues over there. Um, I have been uh, writing about video games. Well, in September, I've been writing about games professionally for 20 years. So I started uh, Edge Magazine on uh, in the September uh, 95 issue, which had Sega Rally, uh, Sega Rally on the front cover. Uh, great issue. Uh, issue 27. Um, <laughs> get to look for it on eBay. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today, I'm, I have to apologise in advance, I, I got back from E3 in Los Angeles uh, yesterday morning, and then I spent the night in a hotel room with my sons and my wife, my sons at the back there, Zach and Albie, and they, they're just getting some wet wipes, God knows what's happened down there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they decided to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning this morning, so uh, that was uh, great fun when you've got jet lag. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit about something uh, that I've thought about a lot with video games. That's where do we get, uh, where do video games, and where do video game writers get that inspiration? Uh, I, before I came into video games as a writer, I actually worked in development for a small studio called Big Red Software and worked on lots of games for Codemasters. And so I've kind of been thinking about this uh, since then. Um, and uh, let's see if I can, make, yes, here we go. So. You can't see the top. Never mind. <laughs> just looks like a lady sitting on a sofa chair. This is basically a, uh, a feature I wrote a couple of years ago called uh, 10 uh, Books Every Gamer Should Read. Um, and it was based on me going around video game studios my whole career. As I've been doing this for 20 years, I think I've probably visited around 200 game studios uh, and talked to thousands of developers. And um, whenever I go to game studios, I kind of sneakily uh, note the books that they have around the office. Uh, and I often ask about it as well, you know, what books influence them. And I've kind of been taking a note of everything people said, and I put it all into this feature. And what I've found is the top 10 uh, books that lots of video game developers read are all kind of similar. They all read things like Lord of the Rings, there's a lot of Robert Heinlein, lots of people have read Neuromancer, lots of people have read uh, things like uh, Joseph Campbell's book, uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. So we have this kind of, uh, in mainstream video games at least, there's this kind of uh, homogenous uh, inspiration, uh, 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 what would you call it, buckets. So buckets of inspiration <laughs> that people draw from. This is going to happen a lot, uh, RE uh, uh, jet lag. So I, I read this feature, uh, and what this feature taught me was two things. Uh, uh, one is that we have this kind of homogenous bucket of, uh, of books um, that we all draw from in the games industry. But it also, it also taught me that people don't actually read the features you've got online. Uh, <laughs> it's a really important thing. If you're thinking of becoming a video games writer or journalist, and you put something online, you're really proud of it, uh, only a small percentage of people that actually go on that page will actually read it. In fact, I can back this up with stats. Uh, we have this uh, system at The Guardian called OFAN. And you can put in the URL of the story you've written, you can see lots of interesting stats about that story. Uh, all that, oh, this is, for example, this is a story I wrote last week. Uh, you can't see the top of it, but it's uh, The Last Guardian, uh, For Me to Reader's Quest for Epic Minimalism. You know, with a title like that, that's a, that's a fucking catchy title. <laughs> You'd expect everyone to read to the end of that, baby. Uh, but uh, here's some stats uh, from that story. So it says, um, it basically, the OFAN can pull down uh, how long people have been active on your page. It, it looks at like mouse movement, scrolling up and down. So according to this, uh, the article has uh, 1,713 words, which believe me wasn't bad, because I was, uh, it was at three o'clock in the morning. Um, it can be read in about three and a half minutes. Of the 11,036 page views that have been done, which would be, had been had at that point when I screen grabbed this, 639 people had spent that amount of time active on the page. So, for, so only 639 people had spent three and a quarter minutes on my, uh, on my uh, epic um, article about um, The Last Guardian. So that tells you anything. That tells you that people don't actually pay that much attention to what you write. You've got to be really, really careful and, and think about that all the time. That's a kind of digression anyway. Uh, I thought it was interesting and also uh, soul destroying. Uh, anyway, so we have this problem in the video games industry, or the, main, the mainstream video games industry anyway, in, in that we have this homogenous bucket of stuff that we draw from. We also have another problem in that lots of video games draw from the past quite a lot. Uh, it's a problem I call the tyranny of video game nostalgia. Um, whenever I go and see video games at somewhere like E3, when I talk to the developers, they'll say, oh yeah, we, have, we were playing this game, we were playing that game, and this really influenced us. Uh, and so we, got, we get lots and lots of sort of game ideas that keep coming up. 
Like, uh, if I, if I think if I have to see another road light uh, within the next couple of months, um, I think I may, I, I may lose it. Even though I completely understand the appeal of that genre, it's just people just keep going back to it. Um, so we, again, we're not really kind of helping with this, this, with this culture. Uh, let's have a look at this. Oh yeah, in fact, this was a, this was a, a quote from Mad Men. This is the first of two Mad Men uh, um, things in this, in this speech. Uh, this is John Draper talking about uh, nostalgia. He says, nostalgia, it's, it's delicate but potent. In Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a twinge in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. And this was supposed to play a gif. I don't know if it will. No, it won't play that gif. But the gif is um, it, from the Sony, uh, it's from the Sony uh, presentation at E3. Uh, and uh, basically, it's this guy reacting to the Shenmue 3 announcement. And it's something, and it's something like, oh my god, my life's complete, thank you, Jesus. Uh, something, or something like that, but that's what he does. Um, and you know, I, I, I wouldn't show this gif because it shows the enormous power of nostalgia in the games industry. And this is why we do keep seeing the same things coming up and up and up and over and over again. At E3 this year, you know, the biggest, the biggest cheers in these conferences, and I went to, um, she went to two of them, two of them I sat in my hotel bedroom and, and watched. Uh, but over and over again, the biggest cheers were things like Final Fantasy VII, uh, Gears of War coming back, um, uh, Shenmue III. You know, these are the things that, uh, that, that drew the loudest cheers, which is quite interesting. And, and, but developers, you know, have probably watched that and think, oh, right, people just want the same games again, I see. Uh, so... Nostalgia is a kind of a, a tricky thing to navigate in the games industry. Um, when I do go around video game studios, uh, I also look at the posters on the wall uh, and look at the videos in their DVD collections. And, and uh, these are some things, uh, if you can see that or on there, these are the things that come up a hell of a lot. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, Star Wars, Terminator, Aliens, Blade Runner, Neuromancer, Akira. These are like the holy texts of mainstream video game development. Uh, um, I think these are the things that Moses would have brought down from the mountain uh, if, 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 if the Bible had been about video games. Uh, <laughs> jet, jet, jet lag. Um, so, so, yeah, this, th these things are absolutely sacrosanct in the games industry, which is, I mean, they're, they're all amazing, they're all brilliant, but time and time again when I talk to developers, they kind of look at these things and, you know, uh, uh, and draw from them. Um, uh, so, yeah, I just, uh, th this is a screenshot. Uh, I said, this could be about 100 different current games, it's, uh, and it's Halo 5, I think, I'm not sure. It, might, it could be Gears of War, I don't know, I think it's Halo 5. But you see, that's, that's what happens. You feed these kind of cultural inputs into a video game and out pops a space marine. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think this is a real shame um, because um, I understand completely the financial pressures that are on video game developers in this day and age. Like the, the average video game a development cost at AAA Studio now is something in the region of 60 to 100 uh, million dollars. Uh, so, you know, that is terrifying. And if you have an audience and a developers that share a love of things like Star Trek, Star Wars, Akira, then, you know, you, you, you will exploit that as much as you can. But it's a shame because throughout my career, some of the most beautiful and interesting games have drawn their inspiration from very, very different places. Like, uh, I don't know how many of you have played Res by Tetsuya Mizuguchi, he's one of the geniuses of, of game design. But his game, Res, which is a kind of into the screen uh, shooter with loads of trippy effects, was it's very heavily inspired by the modernist artist uh, Wassily Kandinsky. Uh, Bioshock obviously was uh, incredibly influenced by the um, objective. Uh, 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 what's Anne Rand's philosophy? Objective. objective. <laughs> <laughs> this is your chance to shine on uh, philosophy. Uh, objectivism. That's it. So it's very heavily influenced by objectivism and also by Art Deco. Uh, Luxury Superbia, uh, wonderful, uh, quite um, kind of saucy game from uh, Tale of Tales. Um, that Tales is one of the most interesting game development studios on the planet. Um, they, they really kind of open about their, their creative process and they create tumblers and they show you where, where they get their, all their ideas from. So even if you don't like their, end, you know, their games themselves, it's always worth going to their blog and finding out how they got to them. Um, they were heavily influenced by Renaissance architecture and garden la uh, landscape design. Um, you know, these are things that you don't often think of when we're thinking of video games, but they were able to draw like a, a inspiration fr from those things. Um, Echo Chrome is just one of the games that's been inspired by the art of uh, MC Escher and his uh, impossible job, uh, uh, architecture. Um, Uncharted, this is a weird one, but I, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the uh, designer Richard Lamartian, who's very active in the indie community and now runs a course in game design at the University of Southern California. But he has spoken 
uh, amazingly well in game design. Um, and, if I, and if you can, I would recommend you go to, to YouTube, look up Richard Marshall, and look up his uh, 2011 IndieCade talk on the beauty of indie games. Um, he's such a polymath, a fascinating man, and can really speak in great detail about influence and, and, and how we can draw influence and how game designers can draw influence from different people. He said that while they were making Unchart uh, Uncharted at Naughty Dog, which is where he was, um, they did a lot of study of a, a guy called Donald Norman, who is a, a, a product designer, an industrial designer, and he's written lots of books about how we are emotionally attached to objects, how we kind of, and, and also um, how objects design kind of shapes our lives and our worlds, and how often, if we can't interact properly with an object, it's not because we're klutzes, it's because it's been badly designed. And uh, Naughty Dog were heavily influenced by Donald Norman's work and his ideas when they were making Uncharted, uh, which is probably why it's so bloody easy. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so yeah, a journey uh, massively influenced by the artist uh, in the middle, Journey, the, P the beautiful PS3 exploration game. It's uh, Giorgio de uh, Chirico, probably pronounced that wrong, um, but a really interesting artist, and he's, his work inspired a lot of, uh, of Journey. Uh, we've also got... Um, one of the things that Lord of the Rings has done is given us this kind of mono mythology that you know all mythologically based games have got to have orcs and, um, and elves and pixies in them, or whatever. Um, so uh, one of the great things that's happening in video games at the moment is that we started to get very confident smaller studios based around the world started to draw on their own mythology and go, no, I don't want to have orcs in my games, thank you very much. Uh, Year Walk by Samogo, for example, was about Swedish folklore, very dark, very interesting game, very worth looking out for. And also Never Alone, obviously, I released um, I think earlier this year, is all about Alaskan mythology and was actually written with uh, a native Alaskan uh, traditional storytellers. Um, all of these games have drawn from places we wouldn't usually associate with video games to produce video games of... Uh, not only like profound beauty, but also really, really interesting to play. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got some. Uh, I went when I was at E3. I managed to get some people to talk about the things that inspired them because I thought that would be useful for any of you who are thinking about being game designers or writers. I thought it would be good to find out, you know, what established people thought of. So uh, one of the first ones I spoke to was David Braben. Uh, and uh, David Raven's a very, very intelligent man. Obviously, he was at Oxford in the, in the early 80s uh, with his co-designer of Elite, uh, Ian Bell. And so I asked David Raven, and I hope this is going to work, uh, and for, I might just have to come out and put the sound file on. Um, I asked David Raven about one thing that inspired him that wasn't from our bucket, our bucket of video game homogenous uh, influential sources. And this is what he said. We are in a mindset where the only solution is democracy. Having to create a game where we have bad guys. I'm not necessarily advocating them as good, but they're just different systems. Um, the, this, the Roman system, the system, the clear system, the system of patronage, has some really bad downsides, but also some really good upsides. So it's just a very different system. So we've put it into our game for the Empire. And I just love the contrasts it creates. And for example, drawing the parallels between imperial slavery where you sign up for a period of time as a slave for money to pay off a debt, which happens in Roman times, um, is actually very similar to signing up to the military. And that parallel, I think, is fascinating. Whereas people accept military service. Oh yes, you might be killed, you know? <laughs> but it's all right for some reason. And yet slavery is seen as a horror because mainly of the abuses that happened beyond the Rubicon in Roman times. So I think that's the, the best thing I can think of. I'm, I'm trying to. There was, there was, there's lots of literature at the time bemoaning it as a crazy system like that. In, in Latin, I'm right about Latin, it's not really good enough, I had to read them in, in translation. But that's the sort of thing that fascinates me as well as science fiction. And also modern politics, as a, as a human race keeps making the same flipping mistakes, generation after generation. And even sadly, in the year 3301, which we are in the game, they were, they're making the same mistakes. But, and that's, I suppose, you know, something that would change. Okay, so that was uh, David Braben uh, giving it as an influence on elite. Um, he was influenced by the Roman uh, uh, literature about the Roman system of slavery. Slavery. 
So uh, he's kind of advocating slavery, I think, there, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, but uh, so yeah, a, a, a really a, a really interesting place to draw inference from. You know, ancient texts on on slavery and politics. In fact, David Raven once told me that. Uh, elite itself, uh, when he wrote it in the 1980s, was really heavily influenced by uh, the political culture at that time, uh, the Thatcherite culture of um, you know being going out for yourself and doing whatever you can to make money. This kind of drew him to make elite, which is a game effectively about going into the galaxy and doing what you can to make money. So you know, um, on one side, Thatcher destroyed heavy industry in this country. On the other side, she helped to make elite. So you know, it's really <laughs> really nice. uh, <laughs> Okay, so, um, oh, there we go, that, that was just him going on about, uh, that, that, was, that was some Romans. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> jet lag. Um, right, create an environment in which you can create. I think this is really important. Another, it's another image from uh, Mad Men. A uh, Mad Men was set during the 60s, and that was a time where lots of psychologists and sociologists were thinking about environment and how it shapes us. Uh, and it was a time when uh, the Rockefellers uh, started their fund into arts, I think that was 1967. Um, and there was a lot of interest and intrigue in the idea of surrounding yourself with art which can make your business and yourself more creative. Here is an image from Mad Men, obviously you can see in the background there's a Rothko on the wall. Um, uh, and Rothko uh, did two, uh, actually, uh, in fact in the 60s, um, arranged for his art, or he was commissioned by two big buildings in New York to show off his paintings uh, in them. I think the Seagram building and another one. Um, and it's interesting, the correlation between art and, and, and consumerism and commerce uh, was, was, was really kind of heavily growing in the 60s. But, you know, that having a Rothko in, in with a bunch of advertising executives kind of says what I mean. You know, they obviously wanted it there because they thought it would make them have better ideas about how to sell stuff to us. Um, but I think there's real validity in this idea. I think that, you know, as a creator, you've got to surround yourself with, uh, with things that are going to help you and inspire you. Um, as well as being a writer, uh, a journalist, I'm also right, I've just started writing a novel um, uh, that I was commissioned to do um, about uh, Minecraft and, and, and parenthood, uh, which is coming out next year, as long as I can write the, the other 85,000 words <laughs> that I need to write. Um, but so I write that in a room which is kind of covered in, in um, uh, drawings uh, that my, my sons have done, because uh, I think that's really helpful and gets me thinking, gets me into that parental frame of mind. So um, some of the most interesting studios that I have been to, I also take photographs while no one's looking, uh, <laughs> some of the most interesting studios I've been to are the ones uh, the, uh, who produce the, the, the best, most interesting games, the ones that surround themselves with art uh, and, and put themselves in an environment that's creative. Uh, the big picture here, uh, if you can see it, uh, that's obviously from uh, Media Molecule in Guildford, uh, which is possibly one of the most creative environments I've ever been in. They've got craft tables, they have life drawing classes. If anyone's kind of stuck on programming, they go and do some origami. <laughs> um, but, so, and they've got drawings that um, fans have, have done of their games, but also their own concept drawings that are all over the walls. It's everywhere. Um, I, it's kind of, I've worked there for a day um, last year, and it's just a wonderful environment, so friendly and so warm and, uh, and, and so conducive, I think, to thinking about um, products. Uh, bottom right, uh, that's the office in Mind Candy, uh, the uh, Mind Candy office, and they've got a whole wall where they've just drawn lots of uh, moshy monsters and laser crazy stuff, uh, beautifully done because they're great artists. But again, that takes up a, a great big part of their office. They've also had all their meetings in a room called the Treehouse. Uh, which is like a little wooden shack surrounded by uh, big pot plants. Crazy bastards. Uh, and they're in East London, obviously. Um, top right is uh, PopCap Games in Seattle. Um, this was actually uh, during, uh, I think it was during uh, Pride weekend. So obviously there's lots of uh, rainbow banners, but I think pretty much the office always looks like this. And again, they've got kind of models everywhere. They've got paintings on the walls. Some of the um, artists have drawn paintings inspired by their games and then they've been displayed. So they're not, it's not like concept art, it's them thinking about their games more and then producing more artworks based on those games and then displaying them for everyone to see. And they've got, you know, every corridor in PopCap is, is covered in these beautiful pieces of art made uh, for and by the staff. And I just think that's really, I don't know, it's, like a, it's kind of like a cycle of creativity that I think is really valuable. Um, lots of game developer studios I've been to haven't had that much on the wall apart from Terminator and Star Wars posters. Uh, so hopefully that, yeah, you can go back to that space marine and suddenly mystery solved. That's why. <coughs>
Um, so let's go on to, oh yeah. So if you can't surround yourself with Rothko's, uh, you know, some of us can't, uh, he's quite pricey. Um, one thing I would say to everybody, and it sounds so obvious, uh, is go to art galleries and museums uh, for, for inspiration. Um, because like the weirdest things can come out of it, and and it's not you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say oh if you love Matisse go and see Matisse in real life. I mean that's valuable, but I would say go to an art gallery with no preconceptions and discover and find out what you discover. And often the, the best thing to do isn't to look at the art itself. Well that's great, but to look at the uh, to look at the uh, the systems that that art was made in. Uh, so to look at the, the the actual words next to the art and read about it. For example, this is an artist called uh, Simon uh, Vink Noog. Vink no Vink Noog. Uh, this is a piece of art, these are two pieces of art that I found in the, uh, in the Rijksmuseum in, in uh, Amsterdam. And it's a, they're pieces from a series he's done called Babylon Construct. And he's, uh, in, he's um, thought of a future metropolis designed around people as homo nudens, which is man the player. The, the concept of man as a player rather than a worker. Um, he's and these are kind of blueprints of buildings he's, de he's thought of which are anti-functional. So he's designed a kind of anti-functional city based around play and he's, draw he's made artworks to, to, um, to illustrate that. And that immediately made me think, you know, well, wouldn't it be amazing to have cities based, around, cities based around fun? And of course we do have cities based around fun. They're in things like Grand Theft Auto. Um, so, uh, you know, I just made that connection. It's an interesting connection to make, and it got me really thinking about our environment and what are our environments built for. Uh, I went to the uh, amazing uh, um, museum in Seattle called the Experience Music Project, which was built and funded by Paul Allen, one of the finders of Microsoft. And the idea of someone from Microsoft doing something amazingly creative, but, uh, you know, is making a museum, is, it blows my mind. But, so there's this great museum in the middle of Seattle uh, and he's got all of this stuff here from, uh, from uh, pop culture, from music, from films, uh, from uh, lo loads of different places. Um, but one of the key things about the museum was it wasn't just showing you stuff, like it had Kurt Cobain's cardigan from the Smells Like Teen Spirit video. That's amazing to see. But it also had these walls full of um, descriptions of how things work in our culture. Like, for example, there's a whole wall just of paintings about horror with amazing definitions of why horror works. Horror is the dark realization and subsequent revulsion that the world is now fundamentally, shockingly, and permanently altered. And what a great premises for a video game! You know, it, um, so you know that I would be—I was scribbling all this down. I was taking hundreds of pictures of this place because it really got me thinking about how things work. Um, amazing definitions of how horror works were on the walls of this museum, all over it. It was incredible. Um, and also, this was really, really valuable to me and helped me write a blog post. Uh, all creative groups can learn from systems from the systems of others. Um, one of the great uh, uh, things they had on at the museum at that time was all about the, the rise of grunge, because obviously Seattle and Seattle was where grunge came from. So this big display on the wall of what it takes for a, an independent music scene to grow up in a particular town, um, and it had this list, and these lists kind of correlated exactly to what it takes for an independent gaming scene to be established in a certain place. For example, key individuals with lots of neat ideas, um, great venues like Loading Bar, uh, <laughs> record labels, well, small independent uh, you know, game makers, a source of youth, you know, lots of the places where game development is really strong in this country are places where there's universities, uh, and modes of communication. So like these days, that'd be things like Twitter and Instagram, and I don't know, whatever the kids are using. Um, <laughs> So, um, so, yeah, so basically I went to this museum, I saw this, and it was about Seattle and grunge and how grunge worked, and I thought, fuck, that's just like video games, and that gave me an idea about how, you know, how video games can foster, creators of crea uh, foster communities of creative people. Um, well, this is, a, this is a really good book, by the way, for going up for learning about the systems of, uh, of art rather than just uh, learning about art. Uh, 100 Artist Manifestos, from the Futurists to the Stuckists. Uh, it's a great book to read if you want to learn more about the systems of art, and I think it's very important to learn about, learn about systems. Oh, uh, we go, oh, that's my bookshelf. <laughs> um, let's listen to Todd Howard. Todd Howard, by the way, is the creative director of uh, Fallout. And this is him talking about what inspires him. I don't sound really smart here, so. And of course, I'm sorry, I'm like an idiot. <laughs> um, how. How cinema can capture a, a space is very different than a game. I think games ultimately do it better, but the uh, movies or things like that that have just a quiet, they're not telling a story. 
Dark Ford movies are odd inspiration for us on this game. A Norman Rockwell paintings. As you mentioned, you used to paintings. And there was a lot of old paintings you look at. Um, they put you in a certain mood. Mm -hmm. That's like the John Ford talks to They put you in a certain mood. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop that short there because I didn't realise there were so many gaps between what he was saying. Um, I'd had a lot of Red Bull that day, so I think everything was going at 300 miles an hour. But uh, so Todd, uh, Todd Howard, creator Fallout, was uh, heavily inspired by uh, John Ford movies and also the paintings of Norman Rockwell when they were coming up with uh, the arts for Fallout. So Fallout is a game based in a post apocalyptic, futuristic sci fi environment, but yet um, he was getting his ideas from uh, John Ford. Uh, Films like the the, the uh, Seekers, is it Seekers or the Searchers? Can't remember. Searchers, Searchers thank you. Um, and uh, so, uh, in some ways, you think, wow, how does, how does you get, how do you get from a cowboy film to a post-apocalyptic environment? And obviously, you know, both of them are kind of like colonial literature in that you are a stranger populating a land, and uh, you know, lots of colonial literature like cowboys and Indians films. Uh, you know, it's about it's about colonials coming in and and, and fighting the unknown. Uh, uh, and you know, to good or bad, mostly bad. Um, but so you can sort of see the influences there from Western films to post-apocalyptic fiction. There's this idea of colonialism and, and, and coming into a, a savage land. Um, and here we go again. There's this. Oh, oh come back. That's normal. What we are. So there's the searches, and there's Fallout Four, and you can kind of see how one fed into the other. And that's really interesting. Like he could have just watched Mad Max and gone, "Oh, right, that's how you do the post apocalypse." Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for that film. But he didn't. He went back and he watched the searches. And I think that's fundamentally more interesting. And there's Norman Rockwell paintings as well. And those are heavily, you can see those immediately in all the kind of iconography of, uh, of Fallout Four. So you can see those kind of images are there. Uh, and in fact, there is Fallout 4 and there is a Norman Rockwell painting. And oh, there's, uh, I think there's some similarities. <laughs> oh, well, I did that one really early in the morning. Um, okay, I was going to talk about Harvey Smith and travel. I think we should do that one because I think that's really important. But I'm going to skip forward because I think we're going to have to miss out Robin Haneke, unfortunately, because uh, uh, what she said was amazing. Oh, yeah, another thing, obviously, what I, what I guess all this is leading to is the idea that um, diversity of thought and diversity of representation are massively important in the creative process. Uh, there was an article in uh, Scientific American in 2004 about this, and it was a really good article because it, kind of, um, it kind of summed up lots of the um, research that's been done into creating diverse environments and how valuable they are. Uh, decades of research by organized uh, organizational scientists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, and demographers, what the hell are they, show that socially diverse groups, that is, those with a diversity of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation, are more innovative than homogenous groups. So you know, this is a, a profound lesson that the video games industry is still struggling with. Uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the effect that uh, when Angela Bassett and uh, Aisha Tyler uh, appeared on, on stage together at the Ubisoft press conference barely a week ago, it creates such a storm of interest. Uh, and you just think, uh, uh, you know, what does that mean about the industry if, if, you, just, if you get um, two women on stage and that is some kind of uh, incredible, pivotable moment. Um, so, you know, diversity of thought and influence, I think, are really important in the games industry going forwards. Uh, what would it be like? Imagine if, when I showed you those pictures of te te uh, Star Wars and uh, Star Trek, imagine if instead the video games industry had been watching stuff like uh, Fantastic Planet, the weird 1973 Czech movie, or Yava, an amazing, interesting uh, African mythology movie about a young girl who befriends a witch, uh, and it's fascinating, could make an amazing game. Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin, what if you know, everyone in games had read that rather than reading Lord of the Rings? Uh, Solaris, one of Robin Haneke, the producer of Journey, one of her favorite films. Again, a really weird, mystical science fiction adventure. What if everyone had watched that instead of Star Wars? Uh, the Handmaid's Tale, I think one of the top five, well, my one of my top five favorite games, uh, books, but why think, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I wish it had been a game, um, but one of the most interesting works of post-apocalyptic fiction ever done, and if I can, if you go away from this thinking one thing apart from, Whoa, what the hell was wrong with that guy, this is what jet lag does, I'm not going abroad ever again, it's read Handmaid's Tale, because it's fantastic. Um, We'd have to wish you off, Robin. I'm so sorry because I want to go back to because um, I think Harvey has got quite a nice message to end on. So really, the point of this, I just wanted to say: um, look all around the world, look at all of your friends, uh, go to art galleries, go to museums, find influences, and stick them up on your walls. 
Uh, Star Wars is great, but it's not, it's not the end or beginning of civilization, until obviously December when the new one comes out. Um, <laughs> Uh, and this is so I asked Harvey Smith, who's one of the great uh, game designers and speakers about game design. I was at E3 with him, and he was talking about Dishonored 2, and he has made obviously Dishonored, and also he was on the Deus Ex um, team, the, the wonderful Deus Ex um, cyberpunk games. Uh, a wonderful game designer, a great thinker. And I said to him, Harvey Smith, um, how should you find inspiration in the world? And this is what Harvey said to me. And I went to Seoul for a weekend. Being on the vegetarian food while I was there. And it was like, it was like things are just different enough. I went to Saudi Arabia for a while, spent a month there. And it was like, I came away changed, you know, because you inevitably hear some snippet of something, even whether it's good or bad. Like, prayer time happened several times a day there, and you hear it from the corners, and the Saudi shopkeepers make their imported like Pakistani workers go out sit on the curb and smoke. They lock their shops, they don't trust them in the shop. They go to prayer. You come back and open and let the workers back in. It's like you see something that stays with you and you're working on some game component and you're a different person because of those experiences. So for me travel is obviously a big one. Uh, really it's it's also knowing people outside of games. Because if you're not careful you go from the convention center to the hotel to the plane to you know your posture apartment downtown or whatever. And it's like you know this narrow slice of people, they all have corporate jobs and media jobs or whatever, they've read the same books. And it's like I like one of the reasons I like Austin is that there's often a mixture of people, at least somebody like that hanging out with like a, a massage therapist, photographer who makes no money whatsoever and lives in the rundown side of town and has parties that feel very different than the parties you have at your place. It has a wacky spiritual belief that you just can't believe an adult just said that, but, it's, but hey, it's like something outside your circle. So I think it's probably travel, reaching for different media, but also hanging out with people other than, uh, uh, like I don't want to single them out, but there's, there's a guy on a team from the Ivory Coast who, uh, he always has anecdotes and stories and growing up, the, the things that he saw and we went through that they, they inherently, you can tell his work is influenced by those things, right? You know, so I think we just need more of that. So yes, Harvey Smith talking about the importance of travel, and you don't have to go to Seoul or uh, or um, or uh, where the other place that he went uh, that has gone out of my mind. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia thank you. Uh, so you don't have to go to those places; you can just go up the road. But uh, like tra travel is a really, really important thing, and also uh, surrounding yourself with diverse people is super important for everything in your life, not just about your own creativity. My name is Keith Stewart. I'm sorry if that was a bit of a mess. I do have jet lag. I don't know if I mentioned that. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye.